This week's performance anxiety features Jerry Gaskell. He's the drummer for King's X. We talk about how he started drumming, how he met the rest of King's X, and how many times they changed names and locations. We also talk about having two heart attacks, getting hit by Hurricane Sandy, and how those were the best things that ever happened to him. Here's Jerry Gaskell. Hey, this is Jerry Gaskell. I play drums with King's X. And this is Performance Anxiety. Keep watching. It's only going to get better. How's everything going? I know you have uh, you try to stay busy. I'm doing great, man. I feel like I'm doing better than ever. Awesome. Awesome. I, was, I, I really was, do. You know what's really cool is I saw, a um, in, in doing research for this show, I saw a video of you and Greg Bissonette at uh, NOM last year. Doing yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, doing, that, doing a, a little drum duo. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It was really cool. Big question I have is: Is that stuff difficult with two drummers? It's, it's always well, just, there's so much going on. It seems like it was totally impromptu. We we of course didn't rehearse it or do anything like that. We just Man. get together. I love Greg. He loves me. He's a great drummer. I play drums. <laughs> for some reason, he likes me, and we decide to uh, play together. And it's just so much fun. We don't know what we're gonna do. And he just starts calling out these different songs. Yeah, that's. And we start playing, and that, and we just try to try to do things that are cool and do licks that will impress each other. <laughs> that, well, that was the thing. That was going to be my next question. You said you, you that was just total impromptu. You, you didn't have any idea what songs you guys were going to play when you when you got up there. Not really. No, we we discussed wow. a little bit. We said well, maybe we can do. Uh, no, well, maybe we can do like a come together thing, or we can do <clears throat> manic depression, or whatever. Yeah. But really, we had no idea what we were going to do. Oh, because, I mean, you did rock and, and roll. That, that's, that's the most fun thing for me to do, actually. To do, not, not having a clue. Impromptu and impromptu. It's, it's funny, you know, uh, I recently had Trey Gunn on, and uh, he was talking about doing that with uh, King Crimson when they did uh, four nights in a row and of uh, the, the, one of the projects that they had done. And he said by the fourth night, they had exhausted everything that they kind of knew, and that's when they really started to get into new material. So yeah, is that does King's X do things like that? Do, do you guys? Uh, uh, and maybe that goes more to uh, to writing and, and recording in the studio. Do you guys come in with ideas? Do you come in with completed songs, or is a lot of it done in the studio? We do all of the above. Okay, we, we we've made records where we had we came in with absolutely nothing at all. Oh yeah, and we've come in with where we've all written songs completely. Oh, we've had wow. songs somewhat written. But when it gets all said and done, we always put ourselves into it. All three of us are a part of each song. Even if it's exactly as the person who wrote it wrote it, we right. still put ourselves into it. And I think that's what makes King's X. The three of us is what makes King's X, King's X. So, yeah, all the above. That, that You know what? I mean, that explains why you guys have such a unique sound. I mean, you know, Doug's vocals are unique, but... Beyond that, Ty's playing is unique. Your playing is unique. Doug's bass playing is unique. And it's uh, when you get three guys who are totally uh, just being themselves, then I think you get something special, a unique sound. And I think that's what why so many people love King's X. I think that might be the key to King's X. I think you hit it right there because we just do what we do. Right. We're not trying to necessarily be anybody else. We, 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 I think we only know how to be ourselves. At least I only know how to be myself. Right. You know, if I try to sound like somebody else, it still comes out sounding like me. <laughs> and I think that's a good thing in, in a lot of ways because oh, it makes it, like you say, unique. And only, I think only the three of us can do what the three of us do oh, together. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, you can learn the parts, you can learn things, but there's a vibe that comes from the person themselves, you know? And you guys have been playing together for a long, long time. And as different names of the same band, kind of, right? Like, when did you guys well, first get together? Well, we've had three incarnations, actually. Always the same guys. Right. But we started off as The Edge. Yes, yes. I and remember. there was another guitar player named Dan, Dan McCollum. It was me, Ty, Doug, and Dan McCollum. Okay. And then he left, I think... I think maybe, maybe we did one show together. And he decided he had to move on, and oh you know, wow, 
live a, live a real life. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, be responsible. So they got married, had kids, whatever. And then we got another guitar player named Kirk Henderson. Okay. And uh, we continued as the edge. And then finally it got to a point where he, I guess he felt he needed to move on, that he wasn't, this just wasn't his thing necessarily. And, and about what time period, what years was this happening? Well, we got together, we met in 1980 and formed okay. in 1980. Actually, I met Doug in 1979, very end of it. Okay. But we formed, I think the first time we got together was in November, I believe, of 1980. Okay. And that's when we became a band. All right. So you, and, you guys uh, were playing in other bands in Springfield, Missouri, correct? Together. Well, we'd all, here's the thing. We had all played in different bands. Ty had played with Doug at times. I had played with Ty at times. I had played with Doug at times. But the three of us had never played together. Okay. And then at one point we said, hey, why don't we become a band? Because we'd already been playing together with all these other people. And we, we loved the way each other played. Or I love the way they play. I think they love the way they play. <laughs> well, you know, 30 some odd years into it, I would say they probably do by now. <laughs> So, yeah, and uh, so that that's that's kind of how that happened. Okay. And then uh, that was 1980, and in 1983, I believe is when Kirk left, okay. and then we became a three-piece. We decided, hey, let's just be the three of us, because that seems to be the core of what we were doing all along anyway. Okay. And then we changed our name. and uh, Yeah, I heard about this. The, yeah, I know. It's kind of sad. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a sad story, but it's part of the story. So there you go. So, um, so we changed our name to Sneak Preview. Yeah. Who, now, Sorry about that. Who, that's what we called it. Who was responsible for that? I don't know. We, we, we were throwing all kinds of names. Somehow Sneak Preview came up. I don't remember. We're talking like, what was 1983? How many years ago was that? Oh, like 35 years, years ago. <laughs> 20, however many yeah. years that was. And uh, so we just settled on that. And I remember we did a show uh, in Springfield. We already had fans as the edge. People loved us. You know, we were starting to build it up. Yeah. And then we changed everything, even changed the, somewhat the style of the music and uh, changed our name. And we announced it at one of our shows. We did a big announcement. Hey, we're a new band now. It's just the three of us. We changed our name. I did a big, big uh, drum roll. And Doug goes, Sneak preview and absolute silence. Just crickets? <laughs> nothing. Nothing. <laughs> not even crickets. Just even the crickets no, not were even silent. Crickets, nothing. It's like, <laughs> and then, um, <laughs> and I remember after we got done with our set, I went down and talked to these girls who were like big fans of ours at the time. They followed us all around okay. as the edge and whatever. They were there for us to support us. And one of the girls looked at me and said, I really feel for you guys. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was that bad. But then we built it up and we, and we, you know, things started to build and build. And by the time we eventually moved to Houston, Texas, okay. you know, things were happening pretty good for us in, in Springfield, but we decided to move to Houston. So you guys are doing everything backwards. So you're building up a following and changing your name, getting another following with that <laughs> name, then moving away. We things backwards. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, seem, that seems to be the, the case with King Jack. Yeah, King Jack does things their own way. So, yeah, I guess we do it our own way. So when did you start playing drums? Ooh. Well, I remember getting my first real drum. It was a snare when I was four years old. Oh, wow. Okay. And I, was, and, I was, and I had a toy kit before that. And I was, and to me, it feels like I've always played drums. It's just what I do. I don't, I don't remember a time when I decided, hey, I think I'm going to play drums now. It's just what I've always done. And even okay. as a little kid with a toy kit, I remember thinking, I even have a picture of this. I think I was behind my kit. I may have even fallen asleep. I'm not sure. <laughs> behind my kit. But I had two girls hanging out with me at the drums. <laughs> and so it was always like, oh, so the, there, there's okay. always that aspect too. Yeah. You know, the girls were always a part of the, <laughs> whole rock and roll thing. That's why a lot of people, a lot of guys get into it. Uh, that's the, hey, there's nothing but wrong with that. That's not why I did it. It was just a part of it. It's just, a, it was a natural thing. It was a bonus. You know, girls like the rockers, I guess. Or, yeah. I don't know what girls like. How can I speak for girls? I don't know. <laughs> they, they appear to like it. They let on that they like it. So anyway, that's what happened. I got my first real drum when I was four. I remember my dad 
went to the store to get it for me. And I was so excited because that's that that meant more to me than anything in life. Yeah. Is I'm gonna have a real drum now. <laughs> and he finally comes home with it. And he comes into the house and he goes, Jerry, I got some bad news. I wasn't able to get the drum. And I'm like, oh, uh, and I remember profusely crying. I remember uh, this, just tears, just just coming out of my eyes like like a fucking fountain. Oh. Uh, and I'm going, oh. And he said, well, can you do just go out to the car? And he asked me to get something for him in the car. Like he left something out in the car. Maybe a cigarette out of his <laughs> Can you go get me whatever it was in the car? So I walked out there all dejected. I'm like, oh. And I did it. Opened up the car door. Right there on the passenger seat was the drum. Um, that's the best parent trick. Almost makes me cry every time I tell the story. That, that's the best parent trick ever. Yeah. Because I, <laughs> I didn't know I was only four years old. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, that that's great. So, and and if you started playing live pretty early too, didn't you? Yeah, I think I did my first gig when I was seven. Wow. <laughs> Jeez. And, and it was actually an audition in New York City for a Kool-Aid commercial. Oh, man. Yeah, that's, that's the truth. Pretty, that's crazy. And it was a band with my brother and a couple other guys from the town I was from, Bridgeton, New Jersey. Uh, Jackie Neff, who played bass, and Robbie Neff, his brother, who was a singer. Oh, man. And the funny thing about it, I remember going to New York City, being so excited, you know, walking down Fifth Avenue and going up and down the elevators and like, just like seven years old. Oh, yeah. Having a great time. <laughs> and uh, I remember going to this guy's apartment and he had us pretend like we were playing for some reason. We didn't actually have our instruments. We just pretended to play. I thought, oh, that's kind of weird, but I'll do it because <laughs> that's the gig. Yeah. And then we ended up in some studio. And I remember them saying, somebody in the control room said, hey, can, can, we, can we have something that features a drummer? And we went, hmm, let's do Wipeout. So we did Wipeout. Oh, at seven. And, uh, yeah, seven years old. Jeez. And I remember... Nothing happened with it. It's like we didn't hear another word about it after we left New York City. But I come to find out many years later, my mom tells me this story, that they were very interested in me and only me. Oh, wow. Yeah. And she tells me, whether this is true or not, I don't know anything about what's ever true. Right. This is just what I've heard. <laughs> but she told me that the parents decided, rather than hurt anybody's feelings, they would just kind of push you aside and say, no, we're not interested. Wow. And that's what happened. Oh. And sometimes I think about that. So I'm thinking, well, if I did get the Kool-Aid commercial, I'm here. I am on the Kool-Aid commercial. I would be that guy. Where's he now? That Kool-Aid kid. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah maybe but that did happen. Possibly not the so drummer. Now, so, now, you. so now it's like, who is he? Yeah. Other than where is he? It's like, who is he? <laughs> well, that's, I guess that that brings me to another question I have for you is that you, when you talk to musicians, you talk to people who really, really into music and may, I guess for lack of a better term or maybe knowledgeable about music, they love King's X, but King's X has never really found a big commercial market. It is. Mm. Why do you think that is? Well, I get asked that question a lot. I'm, yeah, I'm sure. And yeah. And if I knew that answer, <laughs> then we probably would have done that and we would be commercially successful. <laughs> well, so I don't know. The only thing I could possibly think is that we just do what we do. And by being absolutely true to ourselves in every, every way all along, you know, you know, our whole career is just doing what we, what we felt to do. Yeah. That it just somehow that thing didn't totally connect with the general public. Well, you guys, but it did connect with musicians, and musicians, yeah. it seems, from what I understand, what people tell me, and you even just said it yourself, I think, maybe you didn't, I don't know, but other musicians have told us that they've gleaned things from us, yeah, and they're inspired by us, and whatever they've taken from us, they learn how to make it very, very palatable to the general public. Well, what it yeah. seems seems to me is that they, I've talked to when I've I've told people in the past couple of weeks because I'm still new at this, doing this show that when when I mentioned that I've had you come on. They said, this, I love that band. I love it. And from what I've been able to, to pick up is that listening to King's X, they can tell that you guys, like we were saying earlier on, you, you're being yourselves. And that's what a lot of them seem to be 
seem, seem to pick up from you from what I, what I've heard about talking, talking about King's X with other musicians. And I'm not a musician. So when I say other musicians, I mean other people <laughs> that, um, the way you guys play made them, I guess, understand that they can play, they can be themselves with their instrument and, and within their bands. And, uh, <laughs> perhaps maybe that's what everybody likes about King's X is your fearlessness about being yourself and just being true to who you are. Hmm. Okay. Let, let's, let's that be, <laughs> let that be the answer. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm, maybe I'm interviewing myself sometimes. But, um, so <laughs> you do, you guys do have a great, a, a great loyal fan following and uh, you guys are wonderful. You, you interact with your fans a lot like, like you're doing right now with me. I'm sure you get a whole lot of, Oh, this, I've been with you guys since the beginning, or I, I heard this song and I was a huge fan ever since. Is there a song or an album that comes up constantly that you guys hear a lot? Oh, this is the song that really turned me on to, to King's X. Well, I think it just depends on, on the person, the situation. A lot of people cite Gretchen as the album that really did it for them. Okay. Gretchen goes to Nebraska. And a lot of people also, uh, they, they heard King on, um, on MTV for the first time. Okay. And that's where they got introduced to King's X. My wife was that way. She heard, I think she heard King on MTV and went out and bought the record. And okay. that's where it started for her. So I think it's just different for everybody. Dog Man is a big one too. Dog, oh, yeah. That, and, 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 and people seem to still be coming around and discovering King's X. Yeah. I, and I'll tell you what, my kids are discovering it right now because I'm, I'm uh, playing it for them all the time. But well, thanks. Hey, no problem. So you got a whole nother generation, but it, it's and maybe the new record. Will, maybe the new record will uh, even do more. Oh, see, that would be great. And we, let's, let's talk about that in a second. But I want to I want to tell you my story. I was the, okay. the, the way I got into King's X was uh, I was in I was, a, I was big into Megadeth and um, they were on Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey soundtrack. So I picked that up and I'm listening oh. to it, and then all of a sudden, Junior go, uh, Junior's Gone Wild comes on. Yep. And that is the song that got me into King's X. It was just so different, so heavy, and just, this is a band that I need to check out. I need to get into these wow. guys. And so I picked that up and, and I picked up uh, the King's X album, the self-titled album. And I started working my way backwards and then Dog Man came out and I, I picked that up the day it came out. And I, King's X is, for me is one of those bands that, and this is a rarity for me. I, don't, I obviously can't speak for anybody else, but I like you guys more with every album that comes out. A lot of bands, they'll maybe get repetitive or they'll just kind of get stuck in a rut and, and to put out a lot of the same stuff, but every album that you guys come out, I like, I like it better than the previous one. So wow. it's uh, and, and that doesn't happen to me for a lot of bands. So, I mean, 15 was fantastic. Uh, Black like Sunday, uh, manic moonlight. And I, and I love, uh, uh, please come home, Mr. Bulbous. That, that album was my favorites too. I love uh, every track on that is brilliant. So I, I, I love that album, but black, like that Sunday. Was a record we did completely from scratch. Oh, okay. Can you tell me, what do you mean by that? That means we went into the studio with no ideas when none of us brought any ideas in and we just wrote everything completely together. That one and Manic Moonlight and, and most of Tape Hit. Oh, man. That's how we did those records. Oh, and, and I, I, I apologize. I forgot to mention Ogre Tones in there because Ogre Tones to me was great, too. I love that. So, um, now, now, Black Like Sunday, that album was a little different, wasn't it? Wasn't that song, weren't those songs that were re-recorded or weren't recorded before? Are they older the, songs? Those were songs, those are like the earliest songs we ever did. Some of them are like the very first songs we did okay. with The Edge. and. All this, I think most all of those songs were songs from that period. Ah, oh, okay. From the Edge and all songs before King's X. And I become wild 
thought, hey, this Cena stuff is pretty good, so maybe we, why don't we just uh, do that? Throw those songs out there. It's time to make another record. We didn't have any ideas, I guess. Just, hey, we got all the rules. <laughs> well, that's it's, that's really cool. And so, how did you guys become? Since it, they, the songs were from that early period, how did you guys go from sneak preview to King's X? Hmm. Well, like I said, we we uh, changed our name to Sneak Preview at Springfield, Missouri, and we built our following back up. And uh, then there were some people in Houston, Texas, a record company. Actually, it was a Christian record company who believed in us and they wanted us to move to Houston and they were going to help us with our career. Okay. And they wanted us to um, be the band for one of their artists. Oh, okay. we did that. And they were going to help us get a real deal. Okay. As opposed to, you know, the Christian world. Right, right. We were not, that was not the direction we were headed by any means. And, yeah. we've, and we've, <laughs> and we've eventually gotten very, very, very far away from that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not that I'm not thankful for all that I learned in that world. Right, right. But anyway, that's, that's another story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, so that's what happened. So we moved to Houston because they believed in us and they want us to do that. And it was through all of that that, and it was through this record company that we met Sam Taylor. Right, yes. And, and when we got together with Sam Taylor, that's when we changed our name to King's X. And, you know, King's X started and evolved from that. Okay. So who is this other artist that you were playing? Can you guys say who that, who that other artist was that you're the backing band for? I can say that. Who, all right. Who was, and did, did they come out with an album? <laughs> he did. He had plenty. He had, had several albums. I think he had an album out before we met him. And then, uh, we toured with him for a while. He made another record. And I think Ty and Dud wrote most everything. I think Ty wrote most everything on that record. Oh, wow. And um, and we were all originally going to play on that record. Okay. And, uh, but we got together with them, with their producer, and uh, I was playing drums. And for some reason, the guy didn't like like me oh. as far as my playing. He said so they canned me, <laughs> and I didn't play anything on the record. <laughs> oh well, forget. It. I don't want to know who it was. <laughs> then we did, but the funny thing is that later we did some demos with with the three of us. And we weren't actually called King's X yet. I don't think. I don't remember. But anyway, but we did some demos. The guy heard them and he called me and practically apologized to me. He said, man, wow. you know, I wish I had had you on the record. I'm, I'm, I'm like, whatever, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the hell with you. Jeez. Come on. So, man. Yeah, so, so. So we did that. We did that for a little while. And it was in the Christian world. You know, everybody knows it. It's not a secret. And then, then we met Sam Taylor and we started working with him. And like I said, that's where King's X was born. Okay. So actually the first, what, what happened was the first, uh, we were, I think we we're on a plane. I don't remember exactly the story, but Ty played us this new song that he had written that the way he, he puts it, he was hesitant to, to let us hear it because it was so different than anything else we'd ever done. Okay. And so he finally played it for us, and Doug and I both absolutely loved it. And it ended up being the song Pleiades. Oh, wow. Okay. That's and, a great song. and in my mind, that's kind of where the whole King's X thing started. Okay. You know, the drop the tune and the whole thing. It's like, and we just took it from there. Is yeah. it is it harder for you guys? Well, I, I guess maybe the best way to, to rephrase this to phrase this question would be: What's the biggest difference in making music back then compared to making music as King's X now? Is it a technical thing, or is it getting to, everybody together? What's the hardest part about it now? Well, we haven't made music in a long time together. <clears throat> together, so I've, it's kind of hard to <laughs> it's been like almost ten years since we made a record together. We've been so playing a lot together, but we haven't actually come up with new music together in a long time. Are you guys working on that? So, yeah, we're working on it. Uh, how's, yeah. it how's it going? We are. Well, uh, we're definitely <laughs> we're, we're definitely talking about it. Good. All right. So you, it, it's got to happen. It'll happen. That's and good. Uh, and I look forward to it. I think it's going to be going to be really fun to once again 
get together and make music together or new music together and build music together. You know, it's been so long that a part of me is kind of almost nervous about it, but I know that once we do it, it's going to be, you know, it'll be something that we totally love. Because every time I see those guys, even if I've been away from them for months and months and months, as soon as I see them, it's like, these are my brothers, it's my family. Yeah. And, the, and as soon as we hit the first note together, it's like, oh, yeah, this is why we do this shit. <laughs> Back in 2012, you had a, a very a major heart attack. Mm, I did. So, how? And, and I've heard some previous interviews where you say you don't even remember it happening. How did that affect the band? I mean, uh, has it changed the way you play now? Well, I will say that the whole heart attack thing, in many many ways, has been the best thing that's ever happened to me. Okay, you have to explain that. I will explain that. Okay. Uh, it has taught me how to listen to my body because the heart attack, it was, it was the worst thing that could have happened at the moment. Right. It literally took my life away. And had I been alone at the time, I would be dead forever because I, I died. And, and I have no recollection of that even happening. So there's Gosh. no way I could have recovered had I been alone. You know, I was just been one of those guys, oh, drummer dies at home or whatever. Right. But fortunately, my wife was there. She revived me. She called 911, the whole thing. And it was a terrible thing. It's something they call the Widowmaker. It was 100% blockage in my main artery. Wow. It's like, from what I understand, only 10% of people recover from that at all. <laughs> and some people don't recover in a good way either. Right. Uh, right. I determined that. When I was in the hospital, I determined I've got to be better than ever. I'm going to be better than ever, or I'm just not going to ever play again. I'm not going to go out there and just, you know, sort of play and say, oh, he was so good back in the day, but look, he's out there really trying hard. Yeah. So fuck that, man. I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm going to be as good, if not better, than ever, or I'm not going to do it at all. And and I really feel that I'm kind of at that place. And And I've learned how to listen to my body. And I've learned that I have to work my body really hard. You know, we have to exercise. Our bodies are built to move. And if we don't move our bodies, then they're not going to know how to move. And that's when things get all clogged up inside. And that's when, you know, things can happen to us. Right. So we have to listen. And our bodies are talking to us all the time. And we know that. I think we all know that. You know, our bodies say, don't eat that or do eat that. You need to go do something. Yeah. Or don't do that. But we don't always listen. We very rarely listen, I think. And really? I, through this whole experience, all these experiences, had another heart attack, too. Second one. Oh, really? Where I, had, where I had open heart surgery. The first one, they just put a stent in. Right, yeah. And then the second one, I had open heart surgery. And wow. again, I said, oh, I've got to be better than ever. And, 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 I, and I met a trainer personal trainer who just happened to be this huge King's X fan. <laughs> wait, wait, see, look at that. <laughs> Absolutely just changed happened. my life. Changed oh. my life. I love him. Oh, awesome. Actually, my, my, my sister-in-law was doing some classes with him and she wore a King's X shirt to one of the classes one day. Okay. And he was like, King's X, you know, and then got into the conversation. Oh, yeah. So, oh yeah, it's my brother-in-law. Blah, blah, blah. He said, you've got to get him to come to me. I can help him. <laughs> And I did, and it changed my life. Oh, that's I mean, there, there were things in my body, there were things in my body that hurt, that were painful, times I couldn't even move, where he, just by movement, those things don't even exist anymore. And now I work out six days a week. I see him like every other week. Wow. And I, I listen to my body. Best thing that's ever happened to me. And, and, and around the same time, you also had a, you, you you got hit by uh, Hurricane Sandy at the same time. Oh, we did. Yeah, the same year as the first heart attack. It was a few months later. That you, man, you had a hell of a that that's a hell of a year, man. Yeah, which Gosh. that also turned into one of the best things ever. Okay, because through we lost everything we had in that home. Yeah, I remember and seeing your posts. I remember I remember seeing yeah. your posts on Facebook and and how everybody we were everybody fans were heartbroken and and uh, we were we were happy that you'd been recovering from the heart attack, but. 
And then, <laughs> then, then all of a sudden you get slammed with, with Hurricane Sandy. We're like, oh my God, this poor guy. But I never, I never felt any of that stuff. I never felt like, oh, poor me. Well, yeah. I just, I've just learned that we have to always rise above and we always can rise above. We just have to do it. It just takes a little bit of effort. You know, a little bit of effort really goes a long way. Yeah. You know, well, just doing something yeah. leads to something. If you do nothing, that equals nothing. But something always equals something. That's, right? a, that's a fantastic point. That's a- yeah. So, and that afforded us to buy a new home that we absolutely love. And you're and the whole Sandy deal, you know, brought that about. And now you live in New Jersey still, right? I do. Oh, great. I used to live, I lived in New Jersey for 13 years. Where'd you live in New Jersey? I lived right around Branchburg area, sent right around central Jersey. Uh, Somerset, Where is it? Uh, Branchburg. It's uh, Somerset County, right on the edge hmm. of Somerset and Hunterdon counties. Okay. I live in Monmouth County. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Went, went too Bank. far. Yeah. Yeah. I used to go to Red Bank. I and- love it. I went to little town. I saw Chris Isaac play there at the uh, Count Basie Theater back in like yeah, 19- right around the corner from us. We live very close. Oh, to see, place. yeah, back in like nineteen ninety. I played there many times. Oh man, that's, that's a great little theater. I love that place. Yes, it is a great place. All right. Well, speaking of your playing, let's get back to that a little bit. I love your your kit. It's not overly complex. I look at hmm. guys like Neil Peart and 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 Bill Bruford, and they've got like. 800 drums it takes an army of people to move it around they've got mainframe computers to 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 act you know to hit all their triggers is that that almost seems like too much sometimes but you get a great sound out out of out of a much smaller kit is there a reason why you haven't gotten into a a really huge kit besides the fact that it's enormous and a pain to haul around well most all of the drummers that i've been influenced by that i've been inspired by that I've been drawn to are those who play a kit just like what I play. Okay. Like for instance, uh, John Bonham, my biggest influence. Right. Me, Buddy Rich. Okay. Don Brewer. Those guys, Ringo. Oh, they okay. all play that same kit, you know, and uh, that's just what I've always been drawn to. There was a time when I was a teenager, where I had two kick drums and tried to do a little bit of the big drum thing, but yeah, it just never felt like me. So I just whittled it down to, what it is now and and i love it i mean to me that's all i need to do what i need to do you know it, i can do it with those amount of drums yeah. for me when i have too many drums then there's just it, it in a way it limits me okay because there's just too much too much there for me to have to um incorporate into what i'm doing you know if i'm gonna have okay. all those drums i'm gonna have to play them you know, and to me, it's just, it's just too much. Well, that's just me. For me, your sound is more about feel than like you're saying, like, like the incredible array of drums that you have. And, and it's more about groove and, and, and the feel of the song. And um, I guess maybe, maybe that, that's one reason that your, your kid is, your, your kid works for you because you've got that great natural feel and it, uh, it's unencumbered by all kinds of, of nonsense that you don't need. So <laughs> I, I, I really love that, your sound. That is true. That is true for me. For me, it is all about the field. It's about the groove. It's about laying that down and then throwing things in when it's necessary. Some, like fills and accents and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Cause there's, there's a place for all that stuff. Yeah. And people like me here and um, whoever else uses the big kits, that's what they do. And they do it well. And they incorporate that stuff very well. I'm just not one of those guys. Right. Simple as that. So, you, and you just mentioned a lot of the guys that influenced you. Do you listen to any of the of the younger drummers coming up now? And and uh, is there anybody in particular that that you like? Oh, I mean, there's a lot of great. I mean, there's so many great drummers. I mean, everybody today has learned, and this is what we all do. You know, this is what what humans do. We learn. As we go along, and and we, and there's nothing new under the sun. We've right. all learned from the people who have come before us, you know. And then we improve upon that because we see what they're doing, and then we take it further. And uh, so there's just so many drummers out there doing that stuff, you oh, know. Yeah. And I, and I don't know. I mean, I I'm not really a guy that thinks a lot about drums. 
Okay. Even though I'm a drummer. <laughs> I, I, I think more about music and I think about songs and, and drums are a big part of the song. And I, and like I said, I am a drummer, so I do somewhat think about drums, but I'm not only drawn to drums. So is that uh, what the impetus was for doing a couple of solo albums? Yeah, I had to do that because I, I, I write songs. I have melodies in my head. I have, I play a little bit of guitar and, you know, I pick it up and I play a chord and a melody will pop into my head or whatever. I wake up and a melody's in my head and I feel like I have to, I have to finish it. I have to write a song. Therefore, music comes out. And they make records. <laughs> that's, oh, that's great! And, and uh, you sing some also. Have you always so. have you always been drawn to singing, or is it something that you just you do out of necessity? Well, I think I think both. I think when I was younger, I liked to sing. I remember making little tapes of myself singing when I was just a little kid. <laughs> but um, as I got older, when I got into the band, when I met Ty and Doug. And even before that, I never sang in bands. I never did that. Okay. I never sang at all in bands. I just played drums. And and it was only with uh, Ty and Doug that I started to sing. Because there were songs being written, and there's only three of us. And there's there was harmony parts. There's like three-part harmonies at times. Yeah. And there's only three of us. So who's going to sing? <laughs> <laughs> well, and so I kind of got into it. It okay. becomes, sort of became a type of natural thing for me to sing and play kind of with King's X. How hard and then is it? On my own. How hard is it to drum and sing? Cause I, I play a little guitar and there's no way in hell I could ever uh, without, you know, sing down for months and months and months, play a, a, a series of chords and sing. How do you do it on drums? Well, I, I think at first it was a little bit difficult because here's what happens. Here's what, here's where you have to get. What are you drinking, man? What is that? Uh, this is a, I just had the can. It's a spiked Arnold Palmer out of a can. I don't, I don't, I don't know exactly know who made it, but it's not too bad. Yeah, I, I'm drinking Omegon. Oh, I love Omegon. I love, uh, love Omegon. They're fantastic. Good they're stuff. they're, they're, um, they're seasonals. Uh, the one they do for Christmas, the Adoration, I absolutely love that. I don't know that one. It, yeah, it only, I, I've, I've only seen it a couple times a year. It comes out around Christmas time and it's called adoration and it's got um, like a bunch of holiday spices in it and stuff. It's brewed with mm. like cinnamon yeah, three, and nutmeg. Oh. Yeah. I like three philosophers a lot. You ever had that one? Yes. That's a good one. Yeah, I love that. I'm going to show you what I'm drinking right now. Oh yeah. Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> I'm going to show it to you. <laughs> Forget what it, I, just, I just got it. And it's, uh, it's this. Can you see that? I kind of, oh, oh. Which one is it? I can't read the, I, see, I just see the label, but it's I can't the, read it. uh, It's a blonde ale. Ooh. I like the, the this is the time it's of the year for the lighter ale. stuff. Man, that's. But anyway. <laughs> I, I love Oh My God. They're, they're. Oh. I do. It's, it's, it's one of my favorites. And out of New York, right? Yeah. Uh, Cooperstown. Yeah. Cooperstown. Oh, baseball. There you Hall go. Baseball Hall of Fame. Yeah. yeah. Are you a sports yeah. fan? Well, I, I, I was big into baseball. I played a lot of baseball growing up. Okay. And I was really into it. I remember in school, you know, they ask you, what do you want to do when you, when you grow up? What's, what's, what's your career you're going to be? Yep. I would always say, well, in the summer, I'm going to be a major league baseball player. And on the off season, I'm just going to play music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, you got half of it right, man. You, yeah. I got, uh, yeah. And, uh, you were half and clairvoyant. I, for, I was 15, I was 15 years old when I decided I'm just going to stop playing baseball. I'm just going to concentrate on music. And I told my manager of the team at the time, I said, this is it. This is my last year. I'm just going to move on and just make music. Yeah. And he actually yelled at me and told me I was making the biggest mistake. <laughs> <in my life. laughs> but I don't think I did. I could have uh, never been a major league baseball player. You, sh you should send him every single King's X album that you guys have made. <laughs> I don't think I made a mistake. Here's, here's 15 well, albums. I, I think he's probably okay with it. <laughs> so who's your team? That's what he told me. Who, who's your team? So what were we talking about before we talk, start talking about beer? Um, singing, playing drums and singing. At the same time. Yeah, we'll have to say at first, for me, it was a little bit difficult. But here's what you have to do. Here's what has to happen. I think this is with anything. It has to be, it has to get to a point where you're not thinking about it anymore. Okay. Because once you start thinking, once you start thinking, okay, I'm singing, 
I got to, uh, and I got to do this. Oh, this part. Oh, I got to do this part too. That's when you panic and you start messing up. Performance anxiety. It has to just be something that you're not thinking about. It has to just almost, it has to come naturally. Okay. And that, and sometimes things coming naturally takes a little bit of practice. That makes, and, that makes sense. But yeah. But if, it, if you don't have it naturally inside of you, all the practice in the world is not going to help either. Kind of like so there has to be something innate. has to be something a little bit innate, and then you have to practice. And then it becomes almost second nature. Okay. So, all right. So, let's go back to baseball real quick. Who's your team? Who are you, who are you for? Oh, well, I grew up with the Phillies because I grew up outside oh, of Philadelphia. Man, you're killing me. Hey, that's just the way it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm outside I mean, of D.C. I'm, I'm, and then... And then I moved to Houston, and of course the Astros were my team. Oh yeah, yeah, and that's back when they were well, in, I live the in NL. New Jersey. And it's sort of like I don't really have a team anymore, but you know I have family members who love the Yankees. Mm-hmm. So you know I'm I, I really don't have a team anymore. Okay, well, okay, I'll take that. I like okay. a, a, if it's a good game, it's a good game. But I will have to say this: I was very, very, very excited when the Astros won the World Series last year. Oh, that was that fantastic! Was incredible. That right? really was. Oh, that was what a, a good thing series for the whole damn world! It was. Right? What it a was. series! It was amazing. I, I watched that from start to finish. It was a. Oh, right. my that's God. what I'm saying, man. If my Nats can yeah. ever do something like that, I'd be thrilled. But they seem to peter out halfway was, through the season. It was just incredible. Well, it was just the perfect time, you know, with everything that just happened in Houston with yeah. the, you know, the big storms and. And, and, and they did it with all the right attitude. Yeah. And they played great. And they, it was just, it was, it was incredible to me. Well, they, you could tell they, they were just having fun. They were in the moment and enjoying it and, and loving every second of it. They weren't, like you're saying about, you know, uh, play, playing music and singing at the same time. They, they weren't thinking about it. They were just doing it. They were doing it. And they were doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. And they believed. They believed in what they were doing. They were doing it. They were doing it for everybody. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, um, it's incredible. So if I go in and look at your record collection right now, or your CD collection, or your phone, whatever you're listening to music in, what am I going to find in there that's kind of weird that I'm not going to expect? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know what, what you expect. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. Um, I expect, uh, let's see, some, some good, you know, hard rock, some... Thin Lizzy, ACDC kind of stuff, maybe a little Rush, but also maybe some good 60s psychedelia, um, maybe some older jazz, some uh, uh, maybe a little yes here and there. Am I gonna am I gonna find wow. anything that 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 uh, is really strange, like um, Cal Farlow or Antonio Carlos Jobim? Well, I don't even know who those people are, so you're not going to find that. <laughs> uh, There's some old jazz players. But a lot of the obvious things are not the things that I that I listen to, like Rush. I was never a Rush fan. Okay. I just never. See, and that's I an assumption from Rush. And some of it, I, some of it, I really get. And some of it, I know is great, and I appreciate it. But I was never a Rush fan. I never was drawn to Rush. So, what were you listening uh, to when you got started? You mentioned a couple of your influences. I grew up listening to. The Beatles, uh, Bob Dylan. Okay. Uh, I loved Cactus. Familiar with Cactus? No, I don't think I am. Carmine Apice, Tim Bogert. Okay. They left the Melifage, they formed Cactus. Okay. One of my favorite bands of all time. Oh, I'll have to check that out. I've only met like two or three people in my life that were as big of, of a Cactus fan as me. One was Doug. Yeah. And one was a guy named Dave Gowdy, who Doug and I started playing together before we even met Ty. Oh, wow. Yeah. So man. And, uh, and one of the newer bands that I love more than anything is Deftones. Oh yeah. Well, gosh. The, yeah. And, and there was a night when I went to see Deftones and I ended up hanging out with Chino and Chi. Oh, of cool. course, before he died. Yeah. And, and I got down on my knees in front of Chi, it was a, it was like one of the greatest <laughs> nights of my life. <laughs> I got down on my knees in front of him, and I looked at him and said, "Chi, to me, there's the Beatles, there's Dylan, 
and there's Deftones. Oh, man. That's how I feel about Deftones. That's awesome. That had they're to blow him away. Bands of all time. And there's a lot of new music, too, that I love, too. Throw me, out, throw me something that you think, uh, let's see, I like, I like, I'm a big Rush fan. Um, I like, have you ever heard Black Rebel Motorcycle Club? I have not. Okay. Well, they're really good. They're one of my favorites. Uh, who, if, who's a newer band that you're like, that you're listening to besides maybe the uh, Deftones that, that you can throw my way? Something new for me to check out. Doug turns me on to a lot of new things. Oh, yeah. Well, he turned me on to a band called the band Camino that I love. Okay. I'm not familiar with that. Uh, um, let me think of some other things that, that I, that I, that I've recently heard that I love. Uh, hmm. I'm trying to think. I told you earlier, I work out six days a week. Every day I wake up, I go in my basement and I work out. So what do you listen to? to an hour every day. What do you listen to? When you and I try out? to listen to new things every day. Yeah, I try to listen to new things. The last few days I've been listening to Dylan. Okay. Uh, I, I don't picture Dylan as workout music. That's, that's interesting. See, I'm, it doesn't matter to me. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care what music I'm listening to. I can listen to, I can listen to uh, Chopin. I can listen to... W say or whatever. Okay. When I'm working out, I just, I just listen to music. I don't need something to inspire me to work out because I'm already inspired to work out. That's what I do. That's okay. Well, yeah, yeah, you know that. Okay. That makes more sense now that I'm thinking back on what you just said. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's something I have to do in my life. And I'm so far into it that that's just part of my life. I wake up. It's like you brush your teeth. Well, some people don't even brush their teeth. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, like you do, but like you do the things that you do every day. That's what I do every day. I, I work out, man, you know? So, um, yeah, it's hard for me to think of all the music I listen to or cause I'm always open to new things. I want to well, hear. You've given me bands. a couple. You give me a couple. I, I'm going to have to check out cactus. Uh, yeah, the bank that's Camino. an old man, but, yeah, right. come out. but it'll be new to me. Cause I haven't heard them yet. So it's gotta be their first three records though. It can't be anything after that. Okay. Either right. their first record, their second record called, uh, one way or another. And their third record is called Restrictions. Okay. So is this anything after that, it's not even Cactus. So was, was this before they joined up with uh, uh, Jeff Beck and did that trio that shortly? This is TBA? before that. Yes. This All is right. before that. All right. I'll check that out because I like, yeah. I like uh, the BBA stuff that they did. So I recently spoke with uh, another musician about performance anxiety dreams. You've been playing for your entire life. Do you ever have. do you still get any type of anxiety when you go out on stage? Um, and, and this this other musician would get dreams. He would get anxiety after the tour was over, and he would have weird dreams about people leaving the shows and not being able to get there on time. But it was always after the tour was finished. Do you get any any weird anxiety or any, any dreams about uh, fans walking out on you? No, I never think about that kind of stuff. Here's what I do: Kings X. We all live in different parts of the country now. So it's really hard for us to get together and rehearse. Yeah. So we don't rehearse. And we see each other. If we haven't seen each other for, it could be 10 months, I'm just, just as an example. Mm -hmm. And then we have a tour. We get together and we see each other that day. And then we play. Oh, wow. So, But I always think, okay, I, I know this stuff. I can do this. I, I, you know, I've done this for many years. I can do this. And so, but here's my anxiety. The night before I leave, I'm laying in bed and I'm just like, <gasps> all of a sudden, oh my God, do I know these songs? <laughs> oh no, we're doing this tomorrow. <laughs> that kind of a thing. I think, oh my God. So I'm going through all the songs in my head as I'm laying in bed, things uh -huh. like that. Do That's you guys, what I do. Now, when you're on tour, do you guys switch up the set lists a lot or do you st stick with uh, the, pretty much the same set list? Well, we've been doing the same set list for a while. Okay. You know, we could throw some other things in if we want, but but we normally just take things out rather than put more things in. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's fair enough, <laughs> Jerry. I, look, I, it's a little bit harder. We're getting older now, and there's only certain things we can do, and and we live so far from each other, we can't really rehearse. Yeah, so we kind of have a. But even the songs that we do, if we do the same set every night, it's always different because we go into a lot of jam things, and we don't even know what we're gonna do. That's Every fantastic. night is different. You know, we have to listen to each other and any, any one of us can take it to a different place and then we have to follow. Well, is there, so every night is different. Is there anything that you dread playing out of your set list? Any song that comes up and goes, oh gosh, I don't want to play that song tonight oh, or ever. I'm tired of that song. I don't know. 
I pretty much dread everything. (laughs) (laughs) But as much as I dread everything, I also enjoy everything. (laughs) <laughs> All right, Jerry, I'll let you go. I really do appreciate your time tonight. Thank sure, you so man. much for coming on Performance Anxiety. Sure, man. Glad I could do it. Who's that behind you? That's my daughter. Josie, come here. Put the, put the headphones on. Say hi, Jerry Gass. Hello, how are you doing? I'm great. What was your name again? Josie. Hi, Josie. Bye. <laughs> All right. All right, bye. Have a great night. You Have too. a great night. <laughs>